Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out the tube map nearly looked very different. He's talking about London. The tube map is an icon of London, just like Big Ben, the Tower of London, the London Eye and M&M's World. It's instantly recognizable <laughs> to locals and tourists alike, known and loved and parodied all over the world. Really? Hang the on. new version coming out every few months. Y'all know I'm gonna keep stopping this. They put the map on clothes. Wow, they treat it like we treat the American flag. It's instantly recognizable to locals and tourists alike, known and loved and parodied. Okay, what does it say? Rejection, disappointment, backstabbing central, Shattered Dreams Parkway, London. So Ibiza made their own London tube map of Ibiza. With a new version coming out every few months, some people are properly obsessed with the tube map with every vast few months. and can spot the subtlest of differences between different versions. Ugh, look at them. Massive bunch of nerds. <laughs> but don't take this map for granted. This map very nearly looked very different, and the London it's a map of might have looked very different as a result. So, what is the story behind this map? Yeah, what is what? Every few months they come out with another one? In the mid mid 19th century, when privately run underground railway lines first started popping down all under London, the only maps of them available were the ones published by the private companies themselves, showing their own services in clear bold and rival services, mm. if they felt like it, in narrow, faint lines they didn't want you to notice. <laughs> because rival companies were often competing for the same passengers, they very often went out of their way to be uncooperative. This circular route was operated by two rival companies who hated each other. The Metropolitan Railway ran trains clockwise, and the confusingly similarly named Metropolitan District Railway ran trains That anti would be really confusing. Long story. If you wanted to go just one stop, but you bought your ticket from the wrong booth, you had to go the long way round the circle. And there were plenty more examples of uncooperativeness where this came from. For example, if you wanted to change trains at Bank Station, you had to take the lift up to the street, cross the road, buy another ticket, and then take the lift all the way back down again. That would be annoying. London's underground railways could have been so much more useful and attracted so many more passengers <laughs> if they were all run together as a coordinated system. <laughs> useful and back down again. London's underground again. railways could have been so much more useful and attracted so many more passengers <laughs> if they were all run together as a coordinated system. But it would take someone with a colossal bank account to make that happen. Fortunately for Londoners, in 1902, that someone came along in the form oh. of ambitious American railway tycoon Charles Tyson Yerkes, Looks just who had like a him. colossal bank account, a colossal moustache, and a wife called Gutteridge. <laughs> did he have a big moustache? <laughs> he did have a big moustache. Holy... Yeah! Wow. That's a moustache. Good for you, Charles. He was probably highly respected in his day for the moustache. Who had a colossal bank account, a colossal moustache, and a wife called Gutteridge. This is my wife. <laughs> Go on, tell him your name. <laughs> Gutteridge. <laughs> Charles's very American idea was to run a railway network, a group of yes. lines stretching in all directions across the city, where with one ticket you could start your journey on one line and end Brilliant. it on another. Brilliant. So he set up a company called Underground Electric Railways of London, or UERL for short, or UERL for shorter. <laughs> With all the money he'd piled up, he went on an underground railway shopping spree, including four lines that hadn't even been finished yet. Smart. By November 1905, Charles Yerkes was the proud owner of the Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead, Metropolitan District, Great Northern, Brompton and Piccadilly, Baker Street and Waterloo Railway. Nice. And by December 1905, he was dead. Oh. With a very shrewd move of dying, he avoided having to pay back any of the huge debts he'd built Wait, up. Wait, how long after? But One month. One month. Man. Charles. You brought us a wonderful idea. You changed the world with your brilliance. And then you died. And I guess that was your purpose in life. To help with the trains in London. We should all be so lucky to have a life's work, have so much influence. And what a mustache. Was he buried with the mustache? Or did the mustache have a separate casket? I'm thinking is probably what happened. With the very shrewd move of dying, he avoided having to pay back any of the huge debts he'd built up. But his dream of creating an underground network in London had come true. The UERL was a properly integrated nice. system with common ticketing and station buildings that looked really similar. And a proper That's good. network needed a proper map. And so in 1908, the UERL published this. The first map that showed all the underground lines in London mapped on one map. Finally. Including the ones UERL didn't own. 
they had some really handy innovations. Each line was given equal thickness, and each line was given a different colour. <laughs> Revolutionary. Which is familiar to us today, <laughs> even if the colours aren't too familiar. The Piccadilly really? line is yellow! <laughs> This complete map of the whole network was very useful, but it wasn't very Wonderful. easy to read. With all the tube lines and roads mm. and landmarks and army and navy and auxiliary mm, I can't stores, read it. it was a messy clutter with too much information and looked like a plate of spaghetti. The problem was, the task of creating a map of the whole network that was both useful and easy to read was a notoriously difficult one. Lots of companies at this time published their own maps of London's network, each with their own approaches. Some of them bonkers. Yeah, that's hard to read. This one's my favourite. Oh the my Wonderbound god. Wonderbound map by Max Gill. Simultaneously incredibly detailed and incredibly completely useless. <laughs> Mapping totally the entire <laughs> system was only about to get even difficulter. By the early 20s, the London Underground had begun sprawling uncontrollably out in all directions into the distant suburbs. To help manage this growth, the UERL appointed a new head of publicity, Frank Pick. Pick Great was obsessed name. with the Tube's corporate identity, the notion that the whole system should feel more... togethery. It was Pick's idea for every station to have a roundel, the iconic really? logo with the red yes. circle and blue line, Marketing. and for every sign to use the same font with the yes. perfectly round O's and the little diamonds for dots above the eyes, and wow, to commission that's from the all 20s? those lovely posters that your middle class friends have in their kitchens. The branding still looks modern to me, I guess because it's so simple. And the, uh, the lettering is just very clear, it just looks modern. Wow, he came up with that in the 20s. That's amazing. Great branding, too. A, a blue circle with a red line and white lettering. There's contrast, clarity, specificity. It's good branding. I used to have a shirt that had that symbol, and in the middle it said, Mind the Gap. I wore it like twice. I wore it in America, and people were like, Why would you wear a shirt that says Mind the Gap? Because people thought that it meant the, the clothing store. It had a different message entirely in the United States. Most importantly, Pick wanted every leaflet and every poster on every train, on every platform, in every station to use the same map design. And so, in search of the perfect map, Pick turned to a designer named, all together now, Harry Frank Pitt. Stingmore. Ah! <laughs> Frank's. What? Hang on. He's cutting carrots. Why is that? Why is he doing that? Is that part of a joke that I missed? I think he's just cooking. They're subverting the documentary style by just randomly chopping carrots. And so, in search of the perfect map, Pick turned to a designer named, all together now, Harry Frank Pitt. Stingmore. Ah! <laughs> Frank Stingmore's map from 1924 used the River Thames as a geographical reference and nothing else. No roads, no landmarks, no nothing. Just a plain beige background. That's all you need. With easiness of reading at the top of Stingmore's priority list, his map did something that was basically cheating. <laughs> To fit all the detail in, Stingmore took the naughty shortcut of not bothering to draw the distant suburbs to scale. For example, these yeah. stations on what we now call the Northern Line were bunched dishonestly together in a totally fictional straight line. But the that's thing is, need. though, that's the thing. The thing is, this, this is the thing. The <laughs> thing, the thing is, this didn't matter. Right. For passengers trying to get from station A to station B, this map still served its purpose perfectly well. Unless you were driving the train, why did you need to know the exact length or exact <laughs> right. bendiness of each bit of track? Exactly. Come to think of it, even if you're driving the train, you don't really need to know that either, do you? No. Frank Pick was very happy with Stingmore's map. It's so weird to see this now because to us it's obvious that we don't need a geographically accurate subway map. But back then, I guess, map makers were so focused on being exact and accurate. Funny it took so long, isn't it? I mean, you don't even need all those loops and stuff that he has in the map. It could be just a list. Frank Pick was very happy with Stingmore's map, and the public were happy with it too. Stingmore's innovation had shown that a map could still be useful even if the scale was distorted. And it was this concept that inspired another designer to do something even more radical. And his name was... Harry Beck. Is it Harry Beck? It's got to be. It wasn't last time. I think it's Harry Beck. Should we say I'm Harry going with Beck? Harry Beck. It's not Harry Beck. I think it is. <laughs> Let's Harry, Harry Beck. Beck. <laughs> Henry Charles Beck, known as Harry to his no friends, was a 29-year-old... I love that he had voiceover in there of exactly the same thing that I was thinking. So smart. Even more radical. And his name was... Is it Harry Beck? It's got to be. It wasn't last time. I think it's Harry Beck. Should we say Harry Beck? No, it's not Harry Beck. I think it is this time. Harry, Harry Beck. Beck. Nice. Henry Charles Beck, known as Harry to his no friends, was a 29-year-old technical salesman working at UERL. It was his job to draw up diagrams of the tube's signaling systems. 
and then it wasn't his job anymore when he got made redundant in 1931. Ah. Harry must have really missed his old job, because after leaving the UERL, he spent his spare time working on an extremely nerdy work-related project. He nerdily imagined what it would look like if all the stations on the London Underground were represented connected like in a circuit diagram. He was doing this in his spare time, it wasn't his job anymore. This is... this... This is a unique man. This is a man whose passion is creating maps, cartography. He even got laid off, and he kept doing it. I guess people that get laid off from McDonald's still make hamburgers once in a while. I don't know. This is a unique man. I actually want to look up um, the glasses. I'm curious to know if that's a reference to his real glasses. I mean, yeah, they're pretty thick glasses, looks like. You can tell by the way the light is <laughs> about to start a fire on his cheek. Harry Beck, great man, I hope. Working on an extremely nerdy work-related project. He nerdily imagined what it would look like if all the stations on the London Underground were represented connected like in a circuit diagram. He'd seen strip maps of individual Brilliant. lines that totally ignored geography. How hard could it be to combine them all together? While Stingmore's approach was to be a little bit naughty with scale, Beck's approach was that scale could absolutely go f*** itself. Nice. Harry drew the entire network using only straight lines that were vertical, horizontal, or at 45 degrees. Here's one of his rough <laughs> drafts where he rubbed out lines and replaced them with straighter ones. When he finally looks finished, familiar. it looked like this. An elegant, colourful design, with the stations in central London spaced evenly apart and the suburban stations bunched up close together. No opportunity was missed for symmetry, equal spacing, and parallelity. If you compare his design to a scale map, you can see just how not to scale and <laughs> frankly mad it was. Harry's so-called journey planner was not a map, it was a diagram. But for the very ah. specific job he was trying to do, a diagram was better than a map. Yeah. By totally ignoring the concept of scale, he was able not only to fit all the stations in, but to make it much easier to read than Stingmore's map. It also gave the impression of a cohesive, comprehensive, coordinated, connected system. It also looked awesome. <laughs> Harry was very pleased with himself and a thought occurred to him. This <laughs> should glasses. be the official map for London transport. Frank Pick is going to love this. And so, later <laughs> in 1931, Harry marched back into the offices of the UERL, which was now called London Transport, to show his diagram to Frank Pick. But Good design Harry is good wrong. business. <gasps> Frank Pick didn't love Harry's map at all. Wait a minute. Let's just take a moment to appreciate the set design. We have a sign on the back wall that says, good design is good business. A map. And he has his name, Frank Pick, in the l underground logo, and a sign that says my office in an underground logo. What is that? What is this red thing down here? Oh, it's a little bus. <laughs> okay. All right. Back on track. Offices of the UERL, which was now called London Transport, to show his diagram to Frank Pick. But Harry was wrong. Frank Pick didn't love Harry's map at all. Frank, the heck? Pick refused to publish Beck's map on the grounds that it was inaccurate and that the public wouldn't understand it. It's not it a map, it's a indeed a diagram. disadvantage to the scale-free approach. Some stations looked much further apart than they really were, which might make tourists crowd onto the tube for needless journeys, such as Queen's Road to Bayswater, uh -huh. which you can easily do on foot in 19.19 seconds. But Harry Beck was convinced that his design was the future of the London Underground and tried several times to persuade Frank Pick. <laughs> Eventually, Frank Pick gave in. I didn't notice until that that this guy has just been sitting there staring blankly this whole time, even in these earlier scenes. <laughs> Pick. But Harry was wrong. I didn't even notice Frank that. Pick. Eventually, Frank Pick gave in and agreed that if Harry Beck agreed to leave him alone, he'd agree to print a very limited trial Persistence. Run. A small handful of copies were printed and sent to a small handful of stations, with an apologetic cover saying, A new design for an old map. We should welcome your comments. That's a very English thing to have on a map. We should welcome your comments. Like, that's, that's so nice. It's polite. To the surprise of Pick and the I told you so of Beck, the comments they welcomed were overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> Showing comments on a... The oh, God. A okay, we gotta read these. Ooh, it's pretty, so colorful. Central London is much easier to read now, old chap. This makes it so much easier to see where the changes are. Good job. Personally, I'd change some of the colors. I'd say make the central line red and the Bakerloo line brown. 
Also, the inner circle should be shown as a separate route. I'd call, the cir I'd call it the circle line and make it yellow, otherwise very good. An absolute masterpiece, a really beautiful bit of design. Awesome, it looks kind of like a board game. Invest in Bitcoin 90 years early and make squillions. <laughs> you missed out woking. What does that mean? The public seemed to have no trouble understanding Beck's concept. They blooming loved it. Nice. In 1933, Harry Beck's diagram officially replaced Frank Stingmore's map as the standard journey planner used on all leaflets and all posters across the London underground. Good Harry job, Beck Harry. Had done it. He did it. But little did he know, things were about to go very, very wrong for him. Want to find out more? Stay exactly where you are and wait for the next dose of unfinished London. Ah! I guess I have to wait for another video. That was wonderful. I had no idea. I feel like now every train map is like that. Jay Foreman, another wonderful video. He's so funny. He's so brilliant. So I guess, uh, same thing as him. Ditto. Tune into another one to see part two, I guess. Another great video by Jay Foreman. Thank you, Jay. Excellent work. Thank y'all for recommending. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Later.